Hey guys, this is an awesome episode today. We have Peter Esho and we discuss some really big topics. How did Rockefeller make his billions in such a tumultuous time post Civil War in America? We discuss how much can property prices keep on going and how fast. We discuss compound interest and how you can make tens of millions of dollars by making simple little moves today and thinking about the long term. Now, all of that and much, much more, if you stay to the end, you'll get to hear about our top picks, audiobooks, and podcasts that you should be listening to. Um, stay tuned and we hope that you get heaps of value today. Hello, everybody. It's Dominic Neshi and Peter Esho today, our celebrity guest. Thank you again for joining the show. Mate, you're the celebrity. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm, I'm really excited uh, to be on the new backdrop. I'm usually on the old one. Uh, I just feel a lot cooler now. Um, with what we've done right behind us. We've got some good painting in the background. And Pete, I'm, I've am i been looking forward to this podcast since our last podcast. Um, you launched your, uh, your what, Substack, is that what it's called? Yeah, I write a journal uh, once a week. It's a good habit that I have. I, um, it's, it's, uh, Substack is a new newsletter format. Um, and so every Sunday I wind down um, and I just put pen to paper, well, not pen, but I type um, and I just relay some thoughts that are on my mind. And I like that Peter's winding down his uh, reading what Warren Buffett has to say about, <laughs> you know, stock analytics and jumping into, you know, deep historical analysis of, of rising and crashing markets. And, and um, I really enjoy listening or reading your Substack and, and what you've been thinking. It's a lot about what we talk about in the office, yeah. except you take it uh, a lot deeper. One of the, the topics that you mentioned just th this passing Sunday was the hidden cost of, or uh, well, the hidden hidden tax. Yep. And you said that inflation is the hidden tax that we're all paying at the moment. I've spoken about it as well. And you said it a lot last year, and now it's coming to fruition. So what do you mean by it's a hidden tax and, and why should people be paying attention to that? So Dom, we talk a lot about real estate investment. You and I love real estate um, and it's great to get into the nitty gritties of real estate and how to pick a good deal and, and everything else. And I think, you know, sometimes when I step back, I say, why real estate? Why do you and I really love real estate? What are the reasons and how does that fall into the big picture? And you know, these are reflections on why we invest and why it's important and why standing still and doing nothing, like like you've said a lot of times in the podcast over the past few months, is really a risk. And what's happening in, in at the moment is that the price of everything is going up. Yeah, I'm paying $4.50 for an oat piccolo. Um, I'm driving past the petrol station and seeing fuel now almost at $2 as a given. Um, you try getting a tradie out to do one little task and all of a sudden, you know, you're... <laughs> $1,200. $1,200 in the red. And the cost of things is going up. Used cars are going up. 37% um, increase in the value of used cars. Used cars are... Buying a car is the worst investment you can make because it's a depreciating asset. All of a sudden, cars are going up. Uh, the used car market. And so wh what's going on out there? Why are real estate prices continuing to shoot the lights out when all the big banks and all the fancy economists last year said that they're going to fall by up to whatever? You and I sat on a podcast and said that's wrong. Mm. Uh, what's, what's actually going on? And so what is going on is that there's inflation. Inflation is starting to creep in. And if you talk to a lot of people that have come from the Mediterranean um, you know, if you come from a Greek, Italian heritage, if you come from a Lebanese heritage, a Turkish heritage, um, our, our parents and our grandparents experienced hyperinflation. The lira and... Exactly. And so what I'm trying to do is to say, uh, is, uh, is our generation now going through a similar experience that our grandparents went through? And if we are about to, how do we invest for that and how do we protect ourselves and benefit from it as opposed to being threatened? Can I just be contrarian for a second? Because I know we've got a lot of educated listeners that are reading the Fin Review and, and you know, ABS and, and economic data. And they'll say, hey, Peter, is that true? I saw that inflation has actually, is slowing down. Yep. It, it's come off. How It's what, 0.6 or 0.8% or something. So 
what do you mean inflation is coming and, and if the real data is saying that it's dropping? That's a really good point. So um, the central bank, the reserve bank, um, watches a particular type of inflation, right? And so governments report a particular type of inflation. Um, and usually if you have a look at the categories which they measure – there aren't really things that do go up in value and they measure such a wide basket that sometimes some things go up, some things go other. So the official number, you're right, isn't large, but the number on the streets, the number from our pocket, the numbers that we're seeing in the way that we spend every day is changing. And so I'm pointing out to, to things outside of the official numbers. B- basket of goods. Exactly, because at some point in the future, the official basket is going to change. And so we're, we're together looking out and anticipating what happens three or four years from today. No, I'm hearing you. And, and what I like best about this conversation is you say inflation is happen- happening in assets, not just the basket. Just because your pear hasn't gone up in value and the, the, the cost of milk hasn't gone up, doesn't mean that the money isn't going elsewhere and people aren't prepared to spend more on different things. Yeah, 100%. Maybe, you know, milk is up only two cents, but if the house next door is up 250 grand in a month, well, what's more important, milk going up by two cents or the house? Because when it comes to our assets and our cost of living and we're at a stage in our life where we're building assets and providing for our loved ones, what matters is things that are outside of that basket. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because, you know, they're talking about property prices and, and for all of you listening out there, they, when I say they, I'm referring to CoreLogic, um, I'm talking to ANZ, Westpac, all the, the banking economists, and they talk about national figures, you mm. know, 5, 6, 7, 9%, but that's as a national or as a gross average across the state. But in practical terms, if you're looking at specific markets, that ones that we're picking – you're seeing 20% price growth. 100%. And what they also do, Dom, is that they do something called seasonally adjusted. Mm. And so what they'll say is, oh, well, you know, there's one-off factors here and we'll adjust for it. But don't adjust for it because that's impacting me. Don't keep fluffing the number um, because of, you know, one-off. There's always one-off factors. And if you're going to adjust for one-off factors all the time, well, hey, that's not the situation again on the streets. So... um, Things are starting to move. Um, I'm looking for the anecdotes. And I want to talk today with you um, a little bit about the threats of doing nothing. Yeah, well, tell me about it. So why is inflation a hidden tax? Like, why, why, why have you phrased it in this way? Why should people be concerned? And, you know, why is that a thing? So a tax is basically um, a leakage of your wealth. Um, usually it goes to the government who redistributes that and that's fine. I've got no problem paying my taxes uh, to the government as long as the government's doing the right thing um, and they're not wasting money. We all benefit as a society from some form of taxation. Some people might have a different view. That's my personal view, right? But the, the, the tax of inflation uh, is a different tax and it's hidden. It doesn't come out of your paycheck from your employer. doesn't Mm. go to the ATO. (laughs) But, um, you know, if you had 100 bucks in 1980, um, it buys you a lot less today than it did back then. And so that $100 note hasn't changed. What's changed? Inflation has changed. There is now um, a taxation on me for having not invested or spent that. Yep. And so $1,000 or 100 grand today, if you've saved 50 grand in 2030 or 2040 that 50 grand's not going to be able to buy you the same things that it buys you today Mm. and so what happens is you're leaking wealth uh, to a form of taxation and it's a huge form of taxation if you're not being prudent and and investing and adjusting yourself around that and it's a scary kind of taxation because i liken it to that analogy where you know you put a frog in warm water and as you increase the heat it eventually it boils to death and it can't jump out. I liken it to that because people have a sense of security whilst they're losing money. They've got $200,000 in the bank account. They feel that they are wealthy. They Mm. feel that they can do so many different things without knowing that um, whilst they're sitting on it, the value is going down, they're being taxed. And the second thing is there's all the opportunity costs that 
they're missing out on. So that $200,000 could have bought them a beautiful house and grown by 20%, making them 200K on a million dollar investment. Or, and the last thing is they're becoming complacent. They're getting scared and they're, they're borrowing down. And, and we talk about this sometimes, how people are spenders or some people are savers. But if you sit in that mindset and you don't do anything, then you're just going to keep on doing nothing. Doing nothing sometimes is good. When interest rates are at 10%, Mm-hmm. or 15% and I can go and give my money to Commonwealth Bank and do nothing and get 10 or 15%. Beauty. Great deal. Doing nothing when you earn zero or if you're lucky, 0.1, not a good idea, particularly when um, there's a lot happening out there on in the streets that it's indicating that you need to be holding assets. And how much prices or how much how much more can prices go up? You know, is this real? Is it sustainable? Are we in a bubble? Will it keep on going? You know what, Tom? That's what all, all my friends, families, every time we're at a family barbecue or a dinner, it's like, oh, man, house prices. How much further can they go? And and I used to go into these conversations, and this is a very heavy conversation, right? We're, we're 10 minutes in, and I'm trying my best not to bore people and try to make it as interesting and as insightful as possible. But sometimes you don't have that luxury, right? You're sitting with your cousin or your sister-in-law, and, and you try to pierce through. And so I've found, I've found a great way to answer that question. And so people say to me, well, how much further can, can prices go? And I say, what's the highest number? Is, is there an actual number where numbers stop? Yeah, but but um, I'm gonna be the devil's advocate. Let's go. But I but I read the Barefoot Investor, and is it practical for property prices to be twelve million dollars for a, a unit in Sydney? If you had asked my grandma when she came to Australia, um, do you think houses will be worth one and a half million dollars? She would have laughed at you. What she spent fifteen thousand dollars for? Yeah, there's yeah, that's right. Fifteen twenty grand would buy you a house, and you know one and a half people that had a, a, a millionaire was someone in our culture. We've got this thing. It's like oh, he's a millionaire, because it's a, a million dollars used to be a lot of money, and today it's not. And you know the the two million dollar market now in Sydney was where the one million dollar market was. So two mil is a new one mil, and, mm. and we talk about this. So there's no limit to where prices can go. What matters is where prices go relative to incomes. And prices will continue to rise if incomes are rising. If incomes aren't rising, there will be limitations that come in. And so can a hundred grand income go to 150 grand in the next three or four years? All the economists are telling us no. All the economists are telling us that, um, you know, the, 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 the labour market, unemployment. But, you know, they were also saying to us that after uh, JobKeeper finishes in Australia in March, things are going to fall off a cliff. It hasn't. We are now in May and the housing market and the investment market is as strong as it's ever been. Um, there's more people in the streets. And so I look at asset prices relative to people's incomes and I think asset prices will continue to rise as long as people's incomes are rising. They're not rising today. But can they rise in the next three or four years? I believe so. Yeah, I think so too. And I get into this debate uh, with loved ones as well because everyone has a different investment philosophy. <coughs> and some of the people that I debate with have big portfolios. So obviously they know more than me, right? Um, however, the argument that I put forward when we talk about how much can property prices go up, particularly for the residential market, is... The residential market's largely driven by emotion. Mm. Emotion is is irrational by its nature. So when someone falls in love at auction with the backyard or the feng shui was right or, you know, I love the number of the house or whatever that emotional attach- attachment is or the fact that mum wants to send the kids to that private school or to that public school, then you'll spend two, three, four hundred thousand, you'll spend a million dollars more than it's practical. Yeah, that's right. So how much can prices grow? When you're talking about the residential market, it's uncapped in many, many instances. Because if, just because the, I think, I think there's a bit of a disconnect in people's mind where they go, yeah, but you know, Bondi, it makes sense for you to have a six million dollar apartment. And then this, and then they kind of don't, they, they discount the areas that they're in yep. and they don't realise that this whole urban sprawl actually happens and, and suburbs fill up, if that makes sense. 
So everyone that you've been listening, some of you already know, but that I, that concept of urban sprawl, I can't afford Bondi, so I'll move down to, you know, Bronte. I can't afford Bronte. I'll go down to, you know, uh, Tamarama or Coogee or Maroubra, and then you ven- end up all the way south, or you can go west. But the prices just keep on going up because you just want to buy the next best thing. I can't afford that, so I'll buy the thing that's smaller or a little bit less expensive, and the prices just keep on rising. So how much can the prices keep on rising? The other thing is... We, we tend to um, measure house prices in dollars. That is yeah. our currency. That's our currency. So we say $1.5 million. It's not that that house has necessarily gone up in value. It's just that when you have more dollars, if I, if I gave everybody in a particular street an extra mil, guess what? They're going to go and put that into spending and there's going to be an extra million dollars in that community. So the, the, the value of dollars are coming down, right? A mil and a half gets you less. It's not that the house has gone up, it's that the value of that mil and a half has gone down. And so when you're holding onto dollars and there's more and more being created, they're going to become less and less valuable. A Michael Jordan MVP basketball card is worth so much because there was only 10 of them printed mm. in that year. If there was a million of them printed, it would be worth less. So as you add more to the denominator, which is dollars, assets are going to start rising in value. You know what else I think when you said dollars reminded me of? We've spent time traveling. We've been to London and New York and Singapore. And when you've traveled and you've seen what real estate prices are on a global scale or you get a global perspective, Australian prices are cheap. They're really, really, really cheap. What you get here, it's amazing. You know, if you convert Australian property into pounds. Well, let's talk through that. What what happened when you and I landed in London two years ago? My God. We landed, jet lagged. And the first thing we did was move. We went and inspected uh, properties. We went to, to new developments. We went and spoke to agents. We went and had a chat to developers. We wanted to understand the local market. And we were just dumbfounded. We think that we have affordability issues here. In London, they charge you, or in UK, they charge you an additional tax if you want to buy a rental property. Yep. So you own your own home, that's fine. But if you want to, you pay a certain level of stamp duty. If you want to buy and then let it out, they call it buy to let, or if you want to rent it out, you pay an additional surcharge in the form of stamp duty. So they make it more expensive. They don't want you to buy assets there because it's already too hot. Then they have different government initiatives where the government will buy the property with you. Yep. So you'll put in 5%, they'll put in 95%, and as you're renting, you can buy back from the government at higher and higher rates. So our affordability issues, if you put them into perspective, are nothing. What, what was it like when we landed in Singapore, property prices? <laughs> we, we were just laughing. Don and I were literally just listening to prices, turning to each other and cracking up. Um, because Sydney seemed like it was one third to one half like for like at that time. And it still is. If you go to Google now, the UK is in lockdown. Pubs have been closed in the UK since um, Christmas. They only just opened. The UK is, 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 is um, you know, pubs in London are like the lifeblood. They've been closed. You have a look at real estate prices in, in London. They've been going through the roof. We had Brexit, we had all these issues and the market was so weak. And then in the biggest pandemic in our lifetime, the biggest economic shock, prices have skyrocketed. It's not because real estate's changed. It's because the UK government has flooded the system with pounds. The US government has flooded the system with US dollars. The Australian um, government has flooded the system and the Reserve Bank continues to flood the system. The reason you can go, Dom, today to Westpac, CBA, NAB, um, ANZ and borrow three years at less than 2% is because those banks can go to the central bank and borrow hundreds of billions a month at 0.1% and lend to you at like 1.9%. So (laughs) They're laughing. Yeah, there's all this money coming in. That's an important point. Can we just touch on that? Because sure. I don't think a lot of people really understand that specific point. Because you say that the governments are putting money into the system. And we've spoken about some ways. Like people traditionally think about inflation and putting money into the system is quite literally printing monies at a conveyor belt. They yeah. hand it out to the public in the form of cash. 
The other way is you can do government incentives, stamp duty rebates. Like these are other ways that money is being injected into the system. But what you just said is really important because we're saying, well, why is debt so cheap? And what's the other way that prices are being stimulated? It's debt. Yep. And then how are the banks able to afford doing this? Yeah. And, and you just described it beautifully. So how, how does that sort of work in actual fact? So what happened is um, last year, the Reserve Bank not only cut rates to record low levels, uh, but they also a- announced um, a facility uh, which the banks could use whereby they would, um, without getting too, too, too technical, but they basically will lend to banks at 0.1% fixed for three years. So, hey, Mr. A and Z, take, a, take $10 billion at 0.1%, give it back to me in three years' time, um, and you know, lend it out. ANZ takes that and then goes out into the market and says, "Hey, Dom, come and take, come and bring your loan to me, um, and you can have this money for one point nine percent." You think, "Wow, this is awesome!" I went from paying five six percent to one point nine percent. What a great deal! But the deal is really sweet at the bank because he's paying what he's paying zero point one and getting one point nine. So he's putting one point eight in his pocket, fixed over three years. And so what happens is when Dom comes and takes that money, he goes to auction and he goes into the market and he says, you know what, I'm now, f- you know, f- for, a, for a million dollars, it now costs me 19 grand as opposed to 60 grand to hold this asset. I'll pay 1.2. I'll pay 1.3. I'll pay 1.4 because I really like that house. I love it. Give me this house. Yeah. So the Reserve Bank is helping the banks, which are helping the market. And that's, let's trace back the reasons to the root cause and you will see that the root cause is there. So back to the question, how much more can prices rise? They're going to keep rising. I believe we're in um, the exponential age where we are not used to things, we're not used to seeing um, you know, things quadruple or, or two times, and every time that's happened in our recent history when we were growing up, we hear the word bubble, bubble, that's a bubble. But if you go back further beyond where we were born in the 80s and beyond the 50s and 60s and have a look at what happened after the US Civil War, um, you know, Rockefeller, who was the wealthiest man ever, uh, built his fortune because after the Civil War, prices of things started to go up by so much um, that they made a lot of money from selling grain and wheat and all these things. And then he got into oil. Um, If you have a look at the the First World War or the Second World War, prices rose exponentially. And so it's happening now. COVID was like a war. It was a wartime response. And we are now in a post-war type of period where things are going to run really hard. I think that's a really, really good point. And I, I, like you, love reading this type of literature to understand how things happened in the past. Ray Dalio talks about it. All these great um, minds do. And it it helps to put things into perspective. I feel like we are in a time where it's almost like a gold rush. You know, we talk about this. It's it's the age, it's like a dot-com bubble. It's There are different things that are happening in the economy, not just on the property side of things that make us believe that there's, there's, there's a wealth of opportunity out there if you're willing to look, do the hard work and, and you know, source, go for the opportunities. However... In the same breadth, I, I, I want to say that I feel like there's a lot of impatience with that as well. Oh, yeah. You know, you and I talk about 20% price growth. We talk about, you know, digital currencies, double tripling, 100 times value, stock markets exploding in value. We're talking about all these different assets that are doing really well. However, I do still want to stress the assets that we love the most. We love property. You, if after you've bought an asset, it's an unrealistic, expe- unrealistic expectation for you to have 20, 30% price growth after 12 months. That's right. Particularly if you're buying something safe, secure, um, and that's, that's not a hot pot. Because what happens, Dom, is that in the exponential, in the exponential age, things will rise exponentially, but they'll also fall exponentially. It's not just you know a straight line. And so when you don't want to lose and you want to have certainty and you do go for something that ticks every box, be prepared for that to grow steadily and compound over time. Yes. And compounding is really the most important point. That's exactly right. And, it's, and, and you picked that up perfectly because that's what we're after. We're after good quality assets that produce an income that cover the cost of the debt and, and expenses 
and they compound. One of your previous articles that you had written was on compound interest and you put up a calculator, uh, it was a government calculator where you could put in how much money, how, how, many, how much have you got in assets today? What rate of growth do you anticipate between, you know, and, and then it had a, a, a variance of 2%. So say you anticipate 5% growth and then it could be 7 or um, 3%. And then you could put a period of time as well as how much you want to save. Dom love that calculator. My God. I was stuck on the I was on that calculator for more than necessary. Charlotte, we're millionaires. Don't <laughs> realize how wealthy he is and yeah. how wealthy he's becoming. <laughs> no, but it's it's very interesting because you know, when you when you put your portfolio into perspective and when you think about what you're doing in 20 year time horizons it changes everything. Mm. And it's so hard when you're living day to day to think about what 20 years looks like. Yep. We you want know. everything now, right? Yeah, you want everything now. I want to make 100% return on my cash today. There's no use in it doing that in 20 years. It's really interesting, Dom, because like we look back and, and we look at our, uh, our friends from a young age or our friends from school and you know, as you grow older, you change as people and you change not necessarily in big in big jumps, but you change a little bit over time. So you go down this path, they go down that path. And it's the compounding habits mm. that when you bump into your friends, when you're, you know, when you're in your 30s or your 40s, you're like, oh, wow, we started off so similar, but we have so few similarities now. Or we've grown apart or for whatever reason, good or bad, right? It's It's usually good. So it's the little things over uh, the little changes over a long period of time that make the big differences. And so when it comes to investing, people that don't understand investing and have not invested ha want to make quick gains in the short term. Mm. And that is a recipe for disaster. We are in an exponential age, uh, but um, the best investments will end up being the most sustainable and will come out best. So Amazon, for example, and Apple um, are two companies that did the right things during the tech boom. You know, in the early 2000s when every company was becoming an internet company and, you know, there was a lot of crap in the market and, and, the, t and the tech bubble bust, they stayed in their lane, built good products, good customer service, bit by bit every year, and today they are where they are. It's the same with investing. If you think not just what my return will be tomorrow um, or the year after, but what will my return on this asset be in the next 20 or 30 years, you're going to make a lot better choices. It changes everything. If you start thinking longer term timelines, it changes the way you eat, it changes the way you, you, you think about relationships, the way you train or, or don't, or if you're going to pick up a new language, all these little micro behaviours. I, I call it the imperceptible drift i remember reading a book once and, and it's this story is a little bit long but it's in a bit weird but i remember reading this book about um you know if you're walking through a desert and the long story short is unless you had tools for navigation like the north star and stuff and you could orientate yourself if you just walk in a straight line everybody has a natural gait and you'll move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right you don't walk in a perfectly straight line and that little centimetre to the left or the right over 50 kilometres or 100 kilometres, you'll end up in a, a place where you did not expect. You're not going perfectly straight. So when you use that kind of a metaphor and analogy and, and you're thinking about what I'm doing today and then over long periods of time, it's tremendous. And I think as you get older, we're starting to get grey hairs, you, you really do appreciate it as well. You think about what you were doing 10 years ago like, I'm a different person. Yeah, look at our business. Look at our podcast. If you're listening to this, go back to episode one. Oh, God, don't. Have, no, try it. You'll see, you'll see Dom still um, you know, as, as good today as he was back then. But the types of conversations and the, w that we were having then are very different to the types of conversations that we're having now. And it has only been by consistency, you know, you pushing ahead, you continuously trying to improve the format that the podcast today is where it is and, and the brand and the business is where it's at and our clients are reaping the rewards. And in 10 years' time, we're going to be even bigger and better and referencing to podcasts like this.
So, so the, the mess. Thank you, by the way. But and it's it's for all of us. It's Jenny. It's everyone in this team. But what I take out of this is it's it's not about the big drastic changes. Don't be worried so much if things aren't changing so drastically. Just because you're seeing the outside world doing all these different leaps and bounds and, and it feels drastic doesn't necessarily mean you need to have that fear of missing out. Just do the little things simply well and just be consistent and you'll see the returns come in time. I bring this up just because we had a client call us. They bought a property a year ago and they're like, well, I haven't seen <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I haven't seen all this, all this growth. And I'm like, should I sell the property? And I had to explain, don't sell the property. Yeah, It's grown. It has, it, it'll has. it have more equity. Just let it do its thing. Let it take its time. And they wanted to sell and they wanted to try this and they want to try that, but it's... And now keep, wants to buy another one. Yeah, yeah. Just keep a level head. Keep that property. Buy another property and we'll keep on going, you know? And, but I understand it. Uh, you know, when your friend talks about this cryptocurrency and they made, you know, $2,000 jump to 20000 your impulse is, well, I'll give you 10 and it'll jump to, you know, 200. Whenever, yeah, whenever someone asks you, what do you think of, it's usually a sign that they're not taking the right approach. What do you think of Dogecoin? What do you think of blah? And I'm like, dude, you got to think about cryptocurrencies or digital assets in a different way, right? Mm. You either build a portfolio or you stick with the best or what do you think about, you know, Liverpool as opposed to Parramatta? Or it's like, well, let's get the foundations right. Let's think about property investing and what you want your asset to do and is it going to be there in 30 or 40 years? So, um, so they're warning signs for not thinking about investing in the right way. And on the board, you've got Pennywise, Pound Foolish. Oh, yeah. Let's have fun with this one because I feel like we've talked a lot about serious stuff and I don't want to be, you know, the too guy deep. that's too serious or too deep. Um, so We should start shooting this at night and we can have a, a glass of scotch or a Negroni, which yeah. you've shifted to, so then we can sit and deliberate <laughs> and be nice and serious with cigars Crack or something. Jokes. Tell me, what, what's, what's Pennywise uh, Pound Foolish and, and how do we take this into a light manner? <laughs> how do you take that you light? You tell me. <laughs> um, what's pa- what's Pennywise Pound Foolish to you? Pennywise Pound Foolish uh, to me is I save every little cent here and there. Like I won't spend money on a coffee and I won't get soy because it's 50 cents more. And, you know, I, I'm managing, micromanaging all the little itty bitty things. But then when it comes to the big things, I'm not thinking about it correctly. I'm trying to save money and I'm, I'm using the same dollar and cents mentality with the little things as with the big things um and i feel like that could lead to big mistakes so for instance if you're trying to save too much money on a big purchase it may cause you to miss it out so for instance if you're buying a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar asset and you don't want to pay for $10,000 in upgrades because you're trying to save money the same way you do with your coffee. But that $10,000 is going to make you 100000 or 200000 down the road. Or somebody is looking at buying um, a, a real estate investment and um, they're, they're assessing between house A and house B and house B is with a house builder that's cheaper. Mm. And they think, oh, you know, I'll save ten grand, And it's like, well... Are you saving ten grand? You're paying ten grand less, but are you getting fifty grand less in value? Yeah, right. It's, it's you're exactly right. People try to um, pinch pennies, um, and what happens is when you pinch pennies and you're not you're not you're not differentiating between what's an expense and what's an asset, um, you end up blowing pounds. So not everything that you you spend on is an expense. You know, assets rise in value. And you want to buy the most expensive assets that you can afford. I made this mistake. When I started investing, I was looking at cheap, 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 value. Things are cheap for a reason. And my mindset shifted because my best investments have been the most expensive. When I overpaid, when I bought something good. And my worst investments have been when I looked, uh, things looked cheap. So... You know, when I think of an asset now, I want to buy something that's rising. Most people are like, oh, it's already risen. The market's already risen. That's, but that's why you want to buy it. 
you, do you want to buy an asset that's going up in value or going down in value? <laughs> that's a good right? point. <laughs> but when I'm buying a, an iPad for my kids, I'll haggle over fifty dollars because it's an expense. Well, if it's at six hundred, I'll wait until it's at five fifty because it's gonna go to zero. Yeah. So I, uh, for expenses, I want to buy them when they're coming down. For assets, I want to buy them when they're going up. I see assets and most people are like, damn, it's gone up. I'm like, yes, it's gone up because I want to invest in it. And I'm going to, uh, that's a, is that a good quality asset? Is it a bad quality asset? If it's a good quality asset and it's going up, thank you very much. I want to be part of that. Yeah, it's validated my opinion. It's, it's, that's a good point, actually. So Charlotte and I, we're, we're, current, we're still hunting. We're getting close to buying something got FOMO I get bad FOMO I live in a state of FOMO everyone's buying properties around me and I, I can't just yet that's a story for another day however the markets that we're looking at which I'm not telling you on here they're our secrets <laughs> um, they've jumped 20% so the price the properties we were looking at over the past uh, four months have jumped 100 to $150,000 and now Charlotte's scared She's like, hey, have we missed the boat? Should we go into this market or should we be going elsewhere, somewhere cheaper, somewhere that hasn't risen as much? And like you, I'm actually, hey, this is validation. I, I told you the market was going to run. It's going to keep on growing because it's a good quality area. Yeah. And, and $100,000 in the scheme of 20 years, as we're discussing earlier. You're right. You've been proven right. At least now you know your investment thesis is right you're picking areas that are rising in value and timing is timing, but you're, what's more important, being right or, or trying to convert something that's wrong to you being right? Yeah, I'd rather just be right and, and use that same hypothesis to keep investing. It may be 100K more, but in actual cash, it's you know $10,000. I've just got to get the rest as debt. Yeah. Uh, f- fortunately, the debt is cheap, so that's okay. And I think also, Dom, you know, if you have a look at those assets that – I know what you're looking at and it's a really smart, savvy strategy. If you have a look at what's happened over the past five years, um, they're really reaping the benefit in the past six months of a sluggish growth over the past five years. So if you take it over like a five-year average return, you're still buying really, really good value. Exactly right. That's exactly right. So the, the property market doesn't run everywhere equally. This market has in some instances, but you're right in that, largely when you look at the statistics it kind of simmers away it doesn't do a lot there might be a little bit of a drop but then it hammers and then it drops you know it's it's a we have a growth window the last boom what it went from 2014 to 2017 so i'd argue we're near the beginning of the boom and yeah. we've still got legs to go i'm so i'm so positive that i think that we're going to see multi year growth I and you're talking about buying units. I'm talking about buying units. I think units are the best deal going around. The best game in town is buying apartments. And um, you've, you've just offended so many people. They, they hate units. That's all right. Wh- you, you why do you like them? I'd rather you make money and be offended uh, than I tell you what, what you like hearing and, and you don't make money. So um, my, my purpose is to help you build your wealth and grow and tell you things that you don't hear um, or tell you things that the mainstream doesn't tell you because that's how I'm adding value to you. Why do I like them? Because affordability. Because what's happening is that everything's starting to become expensive, um, everything relative to incomes, because incomes haven't grown yet. I yep. believe incomes will grow. But today, incomes haven't grown yet. And so what happens if you're a young couple, um, if you're whoever – and you're going out, working really hard, trying your best to save money, and you want to get in to the market, uh, houses are becoming quite unaffordable unless you're willing to sacrifice location and, and, and go out go into the value curve. And so a lot of people are going to be like, I want to buy something, and I can't afford to spend a mil and a half, two mil today on a house, but I don't want to sit on the sideline and I do want to buy something and, and I'll buy an apartment because an apartment gives me access to infrastructure. It's all done for me. It's a very, very simple thing to have as a landlord. Apartments are the best. Strata is the absolute best deal in town. People hate paying strata. I love paying strata mm. because I've got somebody managing my investment for me. I don't have to worry about cleaning. I don't have to worry about painting 
the corridor. I don't need to worry about building insurance. I can go to sleep at night, pay someone else to do it. It's tax effective for me. Apartments will always bring me versatile, agile tenants. And that's for me as an investor, I want to wake up in 20 or 30 years time and look at my portfolio, not drive out, um, you know, every single day and see what's happening to my uh, and, and, and fix things myself. And it's crazy because, you know, people that don't hate that hate apartments, they they, they want to go buy and, and they want to go develop. But then eventually they'll want to go buy, buy to let. Mervac wants to go buy to let 5,000 new apartments. I mean, if, if Mervac's okay with buying and owning apartments, then why, why are you better than Mervac? Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's right. They know something that you don't. People are scared by, by bad apples in the apartment space. But yeah. that's like saying, I'm not going to send my kids to school because there's be, there have been teachers out there that have done the wrong thing to children. That's, that's such a stupid statement to, to make such an impact and so I think it's very, very silly to apply the same logic to anything in life, right? I'm not going to go, I'm not going to eat healthy because I know someone who was healthy all their life and they dropped dead with a heart attack. Right? Yeah, so I've heard that a few times. It's like, no, there's difference between causation and, and correlation. So apartments are awesome. They're affordable. They're going to rise in value. They're going to become unaffordable. People at some point are going to start doing silly things. And I think um, that's what that's the big risk in this upturn. And this has been a good podcast. Got to sit here and deliberate. I do think our next one should be at night because it is a bit more contemplative. But um, have you got any sort of parting thoughts or or any sort of last tidbits of wisdom before we see you again? I wouldn't call it wisdom. Um, so thanks for having me back on the podcast. It's great. Um, I really like be having these intermittent conversations together. Um, what I found really helpful for myself over the past couple of years is, is, is um, stepping back, journaling. So, you know, on the sub stack I write every week. Um, I made it a goal of my, mine um, at the beginning of the year to make sure I publish one thing a week. Um, so I want to have 52 notes by the end of the year on the, on the sub stack. Journaling is really good because it forces me to think during the week. It's all of a sudden Saturday and I'm like, uh, what am I going to write tomorrow? I've got to publish something. And so systemizing your invest your investment process, for me, it's being able to write something. So I'm always thinking and so I'm in the market, I'm looking for deals. And so whether you've got a dollar to your name or you've got a billion dollars um, in your bank, I think it's important to have a system um, and to think of investing as a process uh, find what you love, so whether it's real estate, whether it's stocks, cryptocurrencies, fall in love with an investment, build a system around it and put some passion into it and you'll reap the rewards. I really like that. J you just reminded me that um, of two things. I love journaling. I'm the same. I journal most days, if not daily, it's, it's you know certainly weekly. Um, and Charlotte and I cleaned out our garage the other day and I found like this big garbage bag of all my old books because I've been journaling for more than a decade and I found all these old books that were, you know, five, ten years old and I've always been a goal-orientated person. I could go back and show Charlotte like what 22-year-old Dominic was wishing and it was just, it was kind of cathartic for me because I was, like, I was like, holy shit, this young idiot was so ambitious. A lot of those goals, I've done them all now but the time scale wasn't right. Yep. You know, I wanted everything in one year. It took 10 years, but I got there, you know. And I'm no less happy having received all of, achieved those goals. So journaling for me has been great. One, for ref being reflective. Um, but two, for just organizing and sorting out your thoughts and how you think. Um, so that's a really, really good piece of advice. And, and lastly, you just reminded me of an email that I received from one of our listeners. And it was a young girl that said, uh, you know, hey Dom, um, I haven't got any money, but I want to buy properties. And you know, what do I do? And it reminded me when I was in when I was a kid and I'd started out. And I basically said to her, look, when you don't have any money, what you do have is time. And what you should do with that time is just go and research as much as you can. So mm -hmm. as you said, fall in love, find something that you really want to invest in, and then just bulk out your knowledge. And I recommend you read. Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, just some fundamentals. Nice. And then 
the richest man in Babylon because it was just a good way to think about investing and that's a good sort of start. Any any book that you'd recommend? I actually um, I'm reading Titan now, which is Rockefeller's book. Okay. Uh, biography. It's like six hundred and something pages. It probably take me like two years to get through it. I'm a slow reader. But I think what's really helped me is podcasting. Um, I'm more of an audio in the car, go for a walk sometimes. Um, and, you know, you can learn so much um, by listening to really good podcasts um, that it completely transforms your life. And I'm sure people listening to this podcast can attest to that. Oh, that's very <laughs> gracious. So all of you, uh, Peter, thanks for the show again. It's been awesome. And, and all of you listening, jump onto Peter's Substack. You're going to learn lots. Um, for all of you that are driving, you know, stay calm. I know it can be stressful on the roads of Sydney. And uh, any questions for any of you out there, please reach out. Our, t- our team loves hearing from you. And um, happy investing and have fun. Thanks, guys.